Welcome back everyone. So now we've been talking about what the nerve cell is, its anatomy is like, and how cells maintain a resting potential. Um, that resting potential is going to depend on ion gradients and ion permeability. If that cell is able to be excited by an electrical current or excited by the change in ions across it, um, it can be depolarized and respond by creating an action potential or a change in that charges across the membrane that make it respond by acting and doing something. These cells that are electrically excitable will have voltage gated channels. That means changing the voltage across the membrane will open these channels. And these will be in addition to the leak channels and the sodium potassium pumps that we just talked about. A voltage gated ion channel, um, if you were to draw it out, it would look something like this. Fold it up, it's going to be something like this. These respond to changes in a voltage. So it's got this um, spot in it where it can tell what the voltage is, typically um, around this fourth subunit, that is going to measure the ion and open up. Um, there are voltage gated sodium and potassium channels that are really important in creating the action potential because when they receive the signal from the voltage, they will open and allow sodium and potassium to flow and maintain that voltage and propagate the voltage. There's also ligand gated channels that um, instead of having a voltage to open it up, they'll have a ligand that will bind to it, some extracellular molecule like a neurotransmitter that will bind to that ion channel and they'll open up and allow the flow of ion channels in response to that signal from that ligand. So voltage gated sodium channels can open very rapidly when they when there's a stimulus and they close again. Um, that's channel gating. And this is an all or none. There's not a little bit of a stimulus so it opens a little bit. It either hits the threshold and opens completely or it doesn't hit the threshold. It doesn't open at all. There's no partially open in this. And in this channel, um, this S4, the fourth subunit, the fourth transmembrane subunit, is going to be the voltage sensor to trigger the cell to open and allow the ions to flow through. Most voltage gated channels have a second type of closed state where they are inactive and unable to respond, even if you have that channel, even if you have that voltage there, because it has this inactivating particle. This inactivating particle can just open right up um, and plug up this channel. And so if you have just propagated a signal, it's going to ensure that the signal continues moving in one direction. It can't move backwards and start propagating a signal through where it just came from because it's closed off. So that keeps the signal propagating the correct way, moving toward the correct muscle to trigger your movement of your body. Um, so that is channel inactivation. Once this this transmembrane channel has opened, then it closes quickly and it's going to have a period of rest where it is not able to be open again. So depolarization means instead of having this negative charge on my membrane, I depolarize it, I allow my anions to cross and I come up to having a positive charge. If I come up enough depolarization to hit this threshold potential, that this line here is my threshold potential. If I hit that line, then I can go all the way up to an action potential. And that action potential is very brief. Here you can see this time is being measured in milliseconds, so it's very fast. Um, but it's very large. You can see it goes from being a negative 60 um, charge on your membrane up to like a positive 40. That's a very strong depolarization. Um, that action potential is brief but large. And then it very quickly is um, responds by repolarizing the neuronal plasma membrane. And that happens by opening and closing um, channels to allow sodium and then potassium to move. This chart kind of takes us through it, how in step one, in our resting state, our gated sodium and potassium channels are closed. There's been no signal to open them, so they're all closed. 
and the resting potential is around negative 60 millivolts. Then there's a depolarization. So something triggers either a, a ligand or a membrane charge triggers the sodium channels to open. And um, you're going to hit your threshold potential and then allow that to open up all the way to an action potential. So the neuron is depolarized by about 20 millivolts to come up to about negative 40. And then it quickly opens up the channels and allows a positive channel, a positive um, charge to accumulate. Then we have this kind of refractory period where this little inactivating particle closes off the sodium channel. So sodium is no longer able to move um, into the cell. Um, potassium is still able to move because these channels are still open. So you can have um, a little bit of a undershoot here happen. Um, hyperpolarization is going to happen as the potassium channels are still open and the sodium channels are closed. So you build up kind of an excess of this negative charge. And then eventually those potassium channels are also going to close back and you'll have a return to this resting potential. So the movement of the sodium and potassium ions, which controls that whole, um, the whole cycle of the signaling, is going to be controlled by opening and closing of voltage-gated channels. And once the action potential is initiated, it travels along the membrane um, through a process called propagation. And so that signal is propagated and continues on opening and closing channels all the way down here. And it moves only in one direction. I cannot move backwards because those channels are briefly closed to prevent that signal from moving backwards. So the action potential moves from one cell to the next until it gets to its target. So development and propagation of an action potential all happen within just a few milliseconds. The membrane potential rises from a negative 60 all the way up to positive 40 millivolts. Then it's going to hit back down to about a negative 75 for that undershooter of the hyperpolarization. And then it's going to come back up and restabilize at its resting potential around negative 60 millivolts again. In a resting neuron, those voltage gated, those voltage dependent channels are usually closed. Because they have leak channels, the cell is much more permeable, about 100 times more permeable to potassium compared to sodium. So potassium is flowing through that cell much more readily than sodium is. When the region of the nerve cell is slightly depolarized, some of the sodium channels are going to open, which increases the depolarization. That little bit of depolarization is going to open more channels. So you'll have more sodium flowing. And that positive feedback loop is called a Hodgkin cycle, where you're increasing the, the flow of sodium because you have already increased the flow of sodium. When the membrane is depolarized by just a small amount, so like here you've just had a small amount, you haven't yet hit that threshold, the membrane potential is going to recover quickly um, because potassium is still moving through those leak channels. You don't hit an action potential um, so this kind of depolarization, where it's too small to hit all the way up to an action potential, this is called a sub-threshold depolarization. It is below the threshold to fully reach an action potential. When the membrane is depolarized past the threshold, then we start opening a significant more number of sodium channels, allowing the membrane potential to rise quickly peaking around 40, positive 40 millivolts. And then once the membrane has risen to its peak, the membrane is going to quickly repolarize because these sodium channels get, get inactivated pretty quickly. And voltage-gated potassium channels are going to open in response to that voltage. And these sodium channels are going to remain closed until we have come back to our negative charge of the membrane which allows this inactivating particle to release um, and it allows the nerve cell to be um, able to be excited again. At the end of our action potential, 
Um, we have this transient hyperpolarization. Hyper because it is extra negative. It's gone below our resting potential to be even more negative. And sometimes that's called an undershoot. And it drops below that threshold just temporarily, very quickly, because potassium is still flowing across that membrane. But as those voltage comes back, um, having that negative undershoot is going to cause our potassium channels to close and allow our resting potential to come back to normal. So for a few milliseconds after an action potential, it is impossible to trigger another one because the sodium channels are inactivated. They cannot be opened by depolarization again. That is an absolute refractory period. During the undershoot, the sodium channels can open again, but the potassium channels are open too. Potassium leak channels and voltage gated channels will be open and drive that membrane potential down to that undersuit. And this is going to be below the threshold for triggering another action potential. So that's called a relative refractory period. Depolarization at one point of the membrane can spread to other regions as you've caused, um, caused that next region to hit its threshold. It's going to signal um, and that depolarization is able to spread. So here you have this incoming signal here or here and that just spreads down through the dendrite into the cell body, down the axon, and it can be propagated down to the next cell. As depolarization is spreading away from the origin though, it can decrease. So signals aren't going to travel far just by carrying that one ion. You're going to have to propagate or keep actively generating that action potential by opening and closing your sodium and potassium channels to allow sodium and potassium to hyperpolarize or depolarize and continue that signaling going down. The incoming signals are going to be transmitted to the neuron at a synapse, that area where one axon connects to the next dendrite. So the incoming signal will depolarize a dendrite and then the, that depolarization will passively spread over to the membrane to the next axon. And here action potentials can be initiated um, and propagated down that axon to the next cell. A cell, um, its ability to propagate an action potential is affected by whether it is myelinated or not. That means if there is a coating of myelin, kind of like insulating that nerve cell or not myelinated, which means it doesn't have that. If a cell is non-myelinated, um, at the start, there's a resting membrane potential and that something stimulates it to depolarize and allow sodium to move in. So membrane potential will be temporarily reversed with those positive charges moving across the membrane and that depolarization can spread as the sodium spreads. This nearby depolarization is above the threshold so that's going to trigger more sodium channels to open and allow more sodium to flow into the cell. And by this time, your cell is also going to, that charge is going to allow those potassium channels to be open. So potassium is going to start channeling, um, spreading out of the cell. The original membrane area here is going to become permeable to sodium. Sodium is going to rush out of the cell, return the membrane to its resting state. But your depolarization is still spreading farther, sending this signal downstream. And this signaling down is called a propagated action potential or a nerve impulse. And it's not going to fade as it travels because we're not just relying on sodium diffusing down the cell. We are actively pumping sodium in through progressive layers of the axon. If your cell is myelinated, that myelin is going to act like an insulator and make it easier for those um, ions to move. Most many vertebrate axons are surrounded by layers of membrane that form a myelin sheath. And myelination decreases the ability of that membrane to retain an electrical charge. And nerve impulses will be able to spread farther and faster in a cell that is myelinated than in a cell that is demyelinated. And the action potential still has to be renewed though, so we still need to keep opening sodium and potassium channels and that is going to happen at the nodes of Renvir. 
Um, I've heard this called Ranvier, 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 Ranvier. Um, I am not picky about how you want to pronounce it. it. Seems like different places where I've lived, um, there's different ways that this is pronounced. These nodes are spaced closely enough to make sure that that action potential at one node will still be able to trigger the next node. Um, so here you have myelin sheath, and this area is your node, and then another sheath, and then a node, and then another sheath, and then a node. So these nodes are the areas between that myelin coat. And because it travels much faster where it's myelinated, the charge is going to appear to jump from one to the next. Um, that's what saltatory propagation, saltatory propagation refers to this charge moving from one to the next. And it's going to be more rapid and continuous than it, what you see in demyelinated cells. And in the node itself, you have a lot of voltage sensitive sodium channels concentrated here. And in the paranodal regions, um, this is where the axonal and glial cell membranes will have specialized adhesive proteins. And next to that, in your juxtaparanodal regions, you'll have a lot of sodium channels. Okay, so we are going to come back and talk about how we are transmitting and integrating these signals through our neuronal cells. Hope to see you soon. Bye.